Welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. Uh, Tony has our bad idea for this week. Tony, what bad idea do you have teed up for us this time? All right, this is actually going to be a few bad ideas amongst a company that had some really good ideas. It's from the A.C. Gilbert Company, and basically their line of science toys that they put out in the early 1900s and into the late 50s. Oh, okay. No, I, I, I've heard of these people. Well, you, like, I'm pretty sure most people have heard about it, even if they didn't recognize it immediately. The uh, Gilbert Company is the one that made uh, the Erector set. <gasps> like, uh, back in the early 1900s, they were the company that came up with that. There were some toys that were similar to it, but they were the ones that really nailed the execution. My dad has some original rec- Erector sets in, like, a big metal box like a, the erector set metal box. I want that so bad. They're probably worth something. I know that you're not going to want to sell them or anything, but I bet you if you looked on eBay, you'd be able to see what those are worth. But this company also went on to uh, make uh, purchase the American Flyer Company and make better model trains. They built kids' microscopes. And a lot of these items still built, uh, still bear the Gilbert name, even though the AC Gilbert Company was basically broken up and bought by several others in the late 60s. Well, this all sounds great, Tony. What could go wrong with a company like this? Well, it turns out that, like many people in the 1950s, they were trying to create some young mad scientists. Okay, okay. It's it's also, a, there wasn't a whole lot of regulation back then, and some of this stuff is stuff that I would have loved to have, but I just really don't see how they thought it was a good idea. Like, starting off, let's start small. Let's go with their glass blowing kit. That doesn't sound dangerous, Tony. My five-year-old can blow glass. Yeah, I mean, if you want your five-year-old to be in control of a lantern that basically burns at a thousand degrees because that's what you have to get it to to get this glass to melt or to uh, to warp, then it's a great idea. Especially if you want your kid being able to use that lantern powered by alcohol to basically mess around with glass that could either explode or shard or anything like that if you get it too hot or not hot enough or try to bend it uh, after it's cooled a little bit. I do want to mention... Even in my childhood, I had a chemistry set that involved one of the things that you could do was bending glass tubes that you'd heated up with the alcohol burner that they included with the set. Some of this stuff is still around, but this particular set was about like six inch glass tubes. So you were having kids put a thousand degree thing less than six inches from their face. And sometimes that glass would just not react well. Okay, okay. So uh, you would have burns, you'd have all sorts of things, but like uh, on the box, it was basically labeled for like six and up. So you're just really having kids that are in early elementary school playing with things that are a thousand degrees. And there are going to be some things in this particular episode where it sounds like, oh, that would be so awesome to have. But a lot of it was just really irresponsible at the time. It builds character, Tony. (laughs) Yeah. Um, They had a lot of really cool stuff that you could do with it. Like you could build a small vase, you could build your own test tubes and beakers. Because apparently college students back in the day were actually required to make their own test tubes. Like it was something that was pretty common. So having glass blowing skills at an early age was probably a pretty good idea. Okay, I can see that. But uh, they also had some interesting things. I went through the uh, the manual for this and they taught kids how to make these really good uh, like dart guns, basically, where you just blow a, a pin through a tube and like just launch it at stuff and like all the different games that you could play. And surely you wouldn't ever use those against parents, friends, small animals, things of that nature. It was a it was a multi-purpose kit. Is there what, what was the problem? OK, other than giving small children very, very hot flames. Were there any other problems with this kit, Tony? Uh, I, I would say most of it was involved with that, like, and the fact that sometimes the glass literally blew up in kids' faces. Most of the, the problems came from inconsistent heating or the kids not being experienced, and sometimes that caused the glass to actually fully shatter in kids' faces. Oh, okay. So there were definitely some dangerous so it sides wasn't to there, it. So it wasn't necessarily the Gilbert company's fault. These kids just didn't know how to blow glass. Yeah. It was a little bit bad. Yeah. Like, didn't you read the manual? (laughs) You got to put it over the very apex of the flame, not on like the wick. That's not the hot part. As we continue with this, their next thing sounds possibly a little bit more dangerous, a little bit more toxic. They had your kid's very first lead casting kit. I can, they have people don't, that is fine. (laughs) You guys, that is fine. It's just going to, like, poison the water, and, like, I'm sure handling it is just great for, like, a five- or six-year-old. 
Especially I went metal. fishing with lead sinkers all the time when I was a five or six year old. Did not do any damage to my head. <laughs> I gotta say, I actually did cast a bunch of lead masks and things when I was a kid using a blowtorch and clay molds. So this is something that I was guilty of, too. But basically, you're giving these kids, like, a small crucible that you melt down a bunch of lead ingots and then use a ladle to dip it in there and then pour it into your self molds that are or your uh, soldier molds, your battleship molds, all these different things that you just have on the table. And it's just, it seems so dangerous to like tell a seven-year-old to literally start casting your own stuff i will say in their defense it, at the time many of your soldier type figurines would have been made out of lead anyway yeah so it's not exactly bad to add more lead to this because that's all that they would have been using anyway it's more the fact that kids are using this to actually cast it themselves okay and just using raw like molten lead in general I, like, I know that the, the melting point for lead isn't quite as high as the glass, but it's still, like, I, I wouldn't trust many kids with a crucible. I shouldn't have trusted myself to do that whenever I was a kid. You should have, Tony. Kids <laughs> need to get out there and be dangerous. Going on to the next thing, like, this was basically the Gilbert chemistry set. This is something that you had access to as a kid, but I'm sure some of the chemicals that were in there weren't quite as bad as they were back then. A lot of the stuff actually came out after they learned about certain chemical reactions that kids had made just through experimentation with this. Like, kids that are slowly turning into chemical engineers at this time period. It wasn't just that they uh, taught kids, like, how to do, like, the little chemicals that you get in modern chemical sets where you turn, like, a blue, uh, a blue vial clear or things like that. Or how to make, like, an acid inert whenever it's barely on, like, uh, the pH scale. But with this particular chemistry set... They gave you instructions on how to make gunpowder. This chemi or these sets also included uh, formaldehyde, hydrochloric acid, and a very strange concoction of uh, sodium ferrocyanide, which, if it was mixed with the other acid in the kit, would full-on make cyanide gas. Oh, good old 1950s American values, Tony. <laughs> I mean, in a lot of ways, I can see this being a great benefit to a kid that's really into chemistry. Like, just get them started early. Some of the kits included, like, some radioactive isotopes and things. So, like, they got a little bit squirrely with that. But you can still buy chemistry sets, but they're a lot less volatile than they used to be, where it was just like, we're just going to give all these kids, like, saltpeter and sulfur and tell them exactly how to make their own fireworks, how to make all of this. That's why we have the internet. Yeah, nowadays, <laughs> I'm sure... Kids can find all that and how to make other various explosives out of house materials, but it seems a little bit weird to just put it in the hands of kids. There was a lot more trust back then. Now, this last one, this last one, uh, whenever I first read it, I didn't entirely believe it until I started looking up. This looks straight out of Fallout 3. Well, any of the Fallout games, really. Like, uh, if I were to send you a link that might be, that might end up in this episode, it basically is a little briefcase called the Atomic Energy Lab. I'm looking it up right now. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Like, it's one of the most sought-after, like, collectible toys nowadays. For the low price of $50, you could get your own Gilbert U-238 Atomic Energy Lab. $50 at the time was not cheap. Yeah, that's about uh, $490 in this today's. Is, this is what you bought your kids back in the day instead of a PlayStation 4. Yep. <laughs> the ability to make their own nuclear <laughs> isotopes. Yeah, I mean, this this just highlights how nerfed of a society we are that instead of building our own nuclear reactors in our bedroom, we just buy PS4s and let other people do the coding work behind it. But inside of this kit, you got a battery-powered Geiger counter. So, I mean, in the 1950s, that was probably pretty useful considering everybody thought that we're, they were all going to die from... Horrible fiery explosions from the Russians. Uh, electroscope, a spiranthroscope, which is basically a way of seeing uh, some of these different chemical reactions, especially uh, ones that spark. Which, while I was reading about this, there were a lot of really weird nuclear toys from the 50s. Like, uh, there was a ring that was, like, uh, based off of a sci-fi show. Whenever you pulled a tab, it started a small nuclear reaction that would just start sparking occasionally. <gasps> and it was put inside of cereal boxes. I love everything about this episode. Just all these things, <laughs> but this in particular. 
you like you have to look up the Gilbert Cloud Chamber. Like this is just such a cool little piece of hardware, and it totally looks like something that would be like on the shelf of a mad scientist chemistry lab. It also came with four different jars containing uranium bearing ore samples: otterite, toberite, uranite, and uh, carnalite. Uh, all of these are actual low-level radiation sources. Like, uh, you got uh, alpha particles from the PB210, the PO210, beta particles from the RU106, and gamma rays. Very briefly, like, the the, the lightest uh, thing in the kit was the uh, ZN65, which is very, very, very poisonous if consumed. Uh, they also came with uh, nuclear spheres for making a model of an alpha particle, which is just basically like a little Lego model set. I love the atomic energy manual for this and the fact that it came with a comic book called learn how dagwood split the atom <laughs> the like this like was actually dagwood very as in from blondie and dagwood like dagwood exactly sandwiches? exactly they actually had a lot of people endorsing this like in the manual you have superman explaining the importance of atomic energy I enjoy the 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 idea that at at certain point Dagwood was a relevant cultural reference for your child <laughs> instead of something that's just there because it's been around forever. Included with this was also something from the US government called prospecting for uranium. On every one of these packages they also included something with that book saying that if you find prospectable uranium, the US government will award you $10,000. So you basically have a bunch of kids looking through through woods and rocky areas around their houses trying to find those uh, uranium veins for the U.S. government to make more bombs. I just got, like, the best Stephen King vibe from that image. <laughs> I saw some uranium! We gotta go look for it! Like, Stephen King with a dash of some kind of sci-fi thing. Although he does a little bit of sci-fi, but... He occasionally dabbles. Yeah. But basically, like, the, the product catalog described the set as uh, produces awe-inspiring sights, enables you to actually see the paths of electrons and alpha particles traveling at speeds of more than 10,000 miles per second. Electrons racing at fantastic velocities produce delicate, intricate paths of electrical condensation. Beautiful to watch. Viewing cloud chamber action is the closest man has come to watching the atom. And basically, it's just showing all these different ways, and apparently there are ways whenever you're actually ionizing some isotopes where you just get a little bit of radioactive steam coming off of this thing to breathe right into your lungs. There's a lot of fun stuff to be f to be had in this thing. That's, uh... I want to point out something, by the way. I am on the Wikipedia page for this Gilbert thing, and we've, we're, we're talking a lot of crap about Mr. Gilbert. However, he was known as the man who saved Christmas because he convinced the U.S. Council of National Defense not to ban toy sales during the Christmas time. I guess there was a lot of heavy rationing and they wanted to take stuff out. And Mr. Gilbert went to bat for kids. Well, AC Gilbert was, was a very fascinating man. He was definitely all about the kids. He was also a magician among also being a toy maker. Like if you look at some of the sets, we were talking about the erector sets earlier, but they had dozens of uh, different sets on architecture, on, on building things, on pretty much anything that you could think of back then. Like the Gilbert company had a really cool set for it. And they definitely had a passion for what they did. The only reason the company really folded from what I saw is that after his death, his kids kind of sold, sold their uh, their owning share immediately instead of trying to continue the work. And it was kind of bungled by the people who bought it afterwards. Oh, there's so much tragedy here. This is not what the episode's about. It's about his sort of overreaching of ideas. But I'm just thinking about this kid who loved kids so... I'm sorry. I'm just thinking about this guy that loved kids so much and yet lost his own children that they weren't interested in continuing on his legacy what a what a rough way to go yeah i also want to point out i'm now I, now i'm just fascinated by ac gilbert he also won an olympic medal in men's athletics uh in the 1908 olympics for the pole vault yeah if you actually look at his wikipedia page he's a very slight guy looks like he'd be fairly athletic my God, he went twelve foot three inches over the like over the pole vault there to win, win a medal. So he's he's just a really interesting guy. I, I couldn't find an autobiography on him. Like I I didn't look that hard because I was more focused on the toys. But it seems like he would be one of the types of people that would fit well on the show. And he did find a lot of success. There were times where the company faltered, but they always had something else going on that kind of kept him kept him going. And like I said earlier, they even changed the way the model trains were done and a lot of other types of toys. 
So I'm glad to see that uh, there are companies that still use the Gilbert name. Like, even after some of the missteps that they had, if you buy an Erector set today, it says from the Gilbert company, even though it's not close to the Gilbert company anymore. Like, uh, they're just paying homage to their uh, to their founder. And he really did make some incredible stuff. You mentioned an autobiography. I did want to point out to our listeners who are as fascinated as I am now by this, that the there is an autobiography of him called The Man Who Lives in Paradise, written by himself and a man named Marshall McClintock. And I'm also seeing a book called The Man Who Changed How Boys and Toys Were Made by Bruce Watson. Like I said, I focus mostly on the toys here because that was kind of like what just spawned Those this. Those are I was the bad at, ideas, to yeah. be sure. I, I was looking at uh, basically what are some of the worst toys ever made? Is there a bad ideas episode in that? And like four times out of these top 10 lists, I just kept reading Gilbert, 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 Gilbert. And I found that those were just very small like pieces of a larger company that are awesome. But sometimes whenever you're trying to make something awesome, you make a few mistakes along the way. And even though like some of these might seem like they're bad ideas, I'm sure it actually helped a lot of kids find a love for chemistry, find a love for nuclear engineering. I possibly even for like the artistic side of like glass blowing and everything else. I think there's a lot of good that could come from these. It just seems like some bad ideas to trust kids with a nu- like mini nuclear reaction. Maybe needed to be directed by an adult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ask your parents for help, kids. But not with the scissors because that's stupid. You can use yeah. scissors. <laughs> all if on you your can't, own. then you definitely don't deserve the nuclear kit. You do not. (laughs) You have to prove yourself with those scissors. (laughs) Anyway, that's going to do it for Bad Ideas this week. Thank you all for listening. If you are listening on iTunes or any other source that allows reviews, we could definitely use some of those. Helps us get put higher in the search engines on iTunes and various other podcasting places. Also, just tell a friend about it if you enjoy this. Share it on your social media. All that jazz. If you really like this, look at supporting our Patreon page, patreon.com slash human echoes, or go to the link in the description, and we will have it there for you guys to check out. It starts at $2, $5, $10 a month. Uh, we are sending out a bunch of pins for members. You get the bonus podcast, which we're going to be putting a sample of that out soon. So definitely check that out, and we will talk to you all next week. Bye, guys. <laughs>